Hey, I'm Derek. And I'm Noah. And you're listening to A Bite Of. Where we take our current favorite pop culture obsession and enjoy it one nibble at a time. Big explosive nibble. Ooh, Doctor boom. Who. Yes. Episode three. Boom. 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 I want you in my room. <laughs> <laughs> we did it together yeah well <laughs> you kind of did it well <laughs> <laughs> so be warned i'm just gonna put this right up front the first two episodes of this new doctor who season we did spoiler free from now on they are going to be spoiler spoiler well, spoiler 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 mm-hmm. so we're going to be talking about the new episode we're also going to kind of go in the tardis a little bit and back up before we get into the new one and just mention some things that we literally, it was written on a document, do not mention these things. We're going to go back and mention them just a little bit um, in case you wanted to hear our thoughts, but also I want to get them out. Yeah, we've been holding in these secrets. It's too much. We have to let them free. We're <laughs> yeah. coming out of the closet. Yeah. <laughs> We're expressing ourselves. Out of the TARDIS. Yes. With all the secrets from episode one and two. That everyone knows now. Yeah. Well, they don't know what we said. <laughs> so before we get into all of that, you know, follow us on all the socials. Make sure you're following the pod. Make sure you're subscribed, whichever platforms let you do that. You guys watching it on YouTube and or Spotify, make sure you're following us. That way you get notifications with new episodes. We do have the finale of X-Men 97 releasing after this one. So Monday, Tuesday, can't remember what day we release it, but it's one of those days. Sometime after this. Yes. So we're starting Doctor Who, but we're finishing X-Men and we have um, quite a big surprise coming up at some point down the line. That has to do with Doctor Who. You'll see. I feel like this is the one of the first times that like two different properties have intercepted. Yeah. Where we're like finishing one, but also beginning one at the same time. Timey wimey. Holy smokes. Mm-hmm. Look at us go. <laughs> so proud of us. <laughs> so make sure you're doing all those good things. Patreon. We are going to be going back to 2000s to the Black Leather X-Men movies. Uh, so that's going to be fun. The Road to <laughs> Deadpool and Wolverine starts now. Okay. <laughs> and that's it. Um, so let's first talk about the things that we've wanted to talk about for oh, so episode wanna, okay. one and two. So Space Babies <laughs> and the Devil's Cord. Okay, so spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Now. <laughs> Officially. Now. Yes. So what are some things you've been wanting to really talk about? Okay, so one, there is this mysterious woman that is popping up. Since this Christmas special to mm-hmm. now, all of the Ruby episodes, there is this mysterious woman, and she's always credited as Susan Twist. I have no theories. I just need to say it and put it out there. I, I mean, I have theories of like maybe it is the Doctor's granddaughter that regenerated. Maybe it's another Pantheon member like the Maestro and Toy Maker. Who knows? But it is here. It's very weird, and especially in. I'm already talking about episode three, but I feel like in those first three, it was kind of glimpses of Susan Twist, right? But in this one, she feels like more of an ominous presence. Well, I think as they go on, they're going to show us more like, hey, this woman is in it. While the other ones, it was very quick. It was like giving tea or she was just in the bar. Um, So, you know, quick glimpses. Yeah, I I have no theories either. But again, this is one of those mysteries that I think we're just going to keep building on as the season goes. Another one of these mysteries that I want to talk about that we got to see, you know, we were talking about motifs and things that are running through this entire season so far. And we keep having these moments where Ruby is either attacked or stunned. And when she's frozen, snow starts to fall. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It started with Space Babies. And it was in Devil's Court and it's in Boom. So we keep getting this snow. I did see, I just want to put this out there. It was a wild theory that somebody had said something about like maybe somewhere somebody made commercial time travel and this is like a Truman situation Mm -hmm. and like the snow is static. So that's a wild theory, right? Snow is only related to her because of her birth of when the doctor found her or when her story started really when there was left on the church. I couldn't even tell you what this would possibly mean. Like, is it actually snow? Is it a manifestation of a time where, you know, everything started for her? I don't know. Like this season of Doctor Who, I can't tell you. Yeah. It's all new things, all new villains. And 
this like through line of the companion with a built-in mystery already. Whew. Yeah, it really does seem to keep reminding us of when she was left at the church. Don't forget, it was the winter. It was Christmas. There was snow there. So it feels very much like a finite point in time that we must always be reminded of. I mean, I'm even now throwing out, is Susan Twist possibly the woman that left her? Possibly. At the church. It's one of those things where I think a crazy theory is if Susan Twist or whatever, you know, if she is the doctor's granddaughter and Ruby is potentially her daughter, that would make Ruby the doctor's great, great granddaughter. So this this season seems to have a lot of things with music, a lot of things with family. I don't know. Like I it's gonna it, it, it will connect. I'm just really curious to see how. Yeah. Because even with the maestro being, from what we could tell, is the offspring of the toy maker, and there's more, and there's people above the toy maker that are more powerful. The one who waits is a great example of another mystery. The golden tooth with the master who picked it up, mm-hmm. <sighs> and it it seems like maestro was kind of even struck by Ruby. Oh, terrified, right? And the fact that. Maestro hasn't seen anything like this. There's a hidden song. There's a hidden song, right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that Maestro, who is so powerful and has basically stolen all the music in the world, has come into contact with Ruby and is completely puzzled by them as well. I mean, it's a big question mark for everyone. Yeah, I think they also said something like, why was he there that day? Something like that. So uh, there's a lot of mysteries, right? These were things that we couldn't say. Yeah. And I just want to like put them out there that way when we're talking about them the rest of the season. It's not like we never brought them up. Yeah. You know? uh, one Another thing I want to mention that probably won't make an appearance in the rest of the season is that in Space Babies, <laughs> said, Nanny... Said about like 34 times in that yes, episode. Yes, <laughs> Is that Nanny was actually Queen Charlotte yeah. from Bridgerton. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bridgerton. Yeah. And like... The, one thing that if you have not noticed listeners that have been with us for a long time, if what we're covering has accents, thus then Derek does have an accent. It might not be the correct accent, <laughs> but there will be an accent. Yeah. <laughs> and there's actually, okay, this is getting in the weeds, but there is, there's a long lost Patreon episode where Noah and I <laughs> cover the first season of Bridgerton and take a Bridgerton quiz that we never released. We just weren't happy with it. Uh, so. Me saying Bridgerton makes sense to me because mm-hmm. we did say it in a long last episode, but uh, it makes no sense to you. That was uh, very early on. <laughs> yes, it yeah, was. Yeah, it was. It was in our makeshift recording studio of blankets. So, I mean, I don't really have much to say about Space Babies, only that it's literally just a sillier version of the movie Aliens, which I did say already, but with the monster being boogies. Uh, it's just amazing. My I thought it was super bogeys. silly. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting introduction too with everybody. It's like they just kind of started and within the third episode realizing, oh, Ruby's never even been to another planet yet. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I if there's one if there's one character from Space Babies that I want to return, it's Captain Poppy. Oh yeah. That angel. They might. I would love it. Who knows? So anything else before we move on to episode three? No, nothing that's sticking out necessarily. Yeah. Luckily, luckily uh, for the Beatles, uh, the doctor and Ruby were there to save them. So that's good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The Beatles. The Beatles. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Totally. All right. So should we do it? All right. Let us officially take a bite of Doctor Who episode three. Boom. Directed by Julie Ann Robinson and written by Stephen Moffat. Rushing to help a person in trouble, the doctor accidentally steps on a landmine on the war-torn planet Castarian 3. In order to not fully trigger the explosive, he must stay calm, keep his balance, and figure out the mystery of what this war is all about. Trying to keep him safe, Ruby gets caught in the crosshairs of the battle, and a roving ambulance does more harm than good. Dun, dun, dun. Kiss, kiss. (laughs) So... Broad strokes, general thoughts of this episode. This is a very weird analogy, and I feel like it's very specific, but great. Watching this episode, if you've ever gone to an off Broadway play performance and there's just a character standing in the middle of the stage and they have all of your attention and everything they're saying is 
filling the entire space. That's what this episode felt like. Mm. I felt like it was starring Shuti Gatwa. He was at the epicenter of everything. And every everything. word he said, I could not hang on anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this, it, it gives me um, flashbacks to watching the episode Midnight with uh, David Tennant's um, Doctor. It all takes place in a train. That's the entire thing. All of the cast is in there. It even got made into a play because of just how well it's written. Um, I love this episode. I'm just putting that out there right now. Final review stamp of approval. Stephen Moffat did it. It's been like, what, seven years since he wrote anything for Doctor Who? He actually started in Russell T. Davies doing some episodes, and then he became showrunner for 11 and 12. Um, So he's great. He's great with these like, one-off episodes he did some of the ones that are like uh blink which is a the famous doctor who episode i feel like people that don't watch it know about that one i that was the first one i think i showed you yep absolutely i want to get him into it he'll like this one and what's interesting of just like being a geek and being in like the geekosphere you know on social media i've seen people dress as those angels and cosplay as them and it's always kind of just been popping up so it was really nice to see what it was all based on yeah i mean he he created the the weeping angels and amazing creature he also did um the empty child he did the doctor that dances the girl in the fireplace i mean he's written some of the episodes of doctor who and a lot of times he creates these monsters or aliens or these creatures and in this one i love that he didn't do that the the thing was how does he figure out how to do anything without doing anything Mm -hmm. the doctor couldn't move he couldn't move his hands he couldn't do anything except for speak and cry um but putting the doctor in the situation like backing him into a corner a lot of times that's when you let the doctor shine Mm -hmm. and this being in the third episode let shooty i mean if you had doubts that he was the doctor come on like the speeches the emotion the figuring out the wit, knowing how heavy a urn or canister or that compressed body was just by smelted, smelted just by like lightly tossing it. That's the doctor. Yeah. I, so I have a question as someone who is a longtime doctor who fan, I feel like we got three different types of doctor who episodes in these first three, right? We had zany space adventure. We had, um, historic action. And then we had future war with, commentary on society so are you are you grateful for these switches between types of episodes is there one you gravitate towards more this is doctor who Mm -hmm. this is what it's about right it's it's having a through line having this big overarching story with this character that you know and love in their spaceship and then each week going to a different place and what happens it always does yeah i think this episode i actually really thought about it uh, consciously and it's like with what happens with ruby in this right it's like she's like pretty much dying mm. and i was thinking i'm like but they're, they're then they're gonna go back into the tardis and like keep going and if i was ruby i'd be like can i just like go home for like two seconds i almost died like, <laughs> like just keep yeah. doing it which i mean i probably would too but like i would need like a little tiny break i think one of the things that's so interesting to me about the doctor's relationship with the companion is that I feel like the relationship building, a lot of it happens in the time between episodes, right? Right. We don't know how long they've been traveling between each episode. And at the start of this episode, you know, we see him running out because he hears someone in distress and, you know, Ruby's left behind like, okay, here he goes again. I'll Mm -hmm. just lock up the TARDIS behind him. It's not a big deal. So there's, there's so much of a relationship that's been built between the two that we're seeing it sort of grow and fast forward for our eyes, but there's stuff happening in between that we don't even know about. Well, I was happy for this episode that we actually got to see them act on that, right? Mm-hmm. Because there, there is, they do have adventures in between the ones that we see, right? And how much he cares for her, we really saw it in this episode. And like whenever she has to give him the urn to counterbalance his weight so he could put his foot down, how he really was like, you're brilliant, you're brave, you're important, you're all of these things. And like, we haven't really seen that yet Mm. with these two. Mm. And I was grateful for that because we needed to know that they care about each other as much as we care about them. Yes. It's a very important step for the doctor and companion. 
Yeah. And I think that even just looking at that word companion, right? It's not assistant. It's not sidekick. It's their companion. There's so much more to that word. It really is someone that there's a close bond with. And we get to see that in this episode, especially in how much he cares for her. And knowing that he is sort of trapped in this moment, he doesn't want to bring her into it. But she cares for him so much, she's willing to put her life on the line and saying, well, I'm in this with you, so we have to get through this together. Yeah. So, I mean, he's on a landmine, right? And so he can't do anything. And on top of having them show that they really care about each other, I really liked seeing Ruby push back at him. So in, again, the same scene where she has to hand him the urn, he's like, just toss it to me. And she's like, no, I'm going to hand it to you. And he's like, well, you could die. You're going to be too close. And she combats him a little bit. And I I like that in a companion where it's like, yes, you're clever. You're a clever man, but trust me on this. Like I can do this. Yeah. You might be able to know the weight of something by looking at it, but like, can I'm sure footed. I sure. can hand it to you. When, when she first said no, in my mind, I'm like, well, I know that if I were the companion and someone asked me to throw them something from this far away, it would not go well. So you're more in like, I know in my ability, I yeah. can't throw it, right? Yeah. So- <laughs> what I got going for me, humor, heart, throwing, no, not one of them. That's why we're doing a podcast Ex- in sports. <laughs> exactly. I don't even know if I can throw a ball, but, but I agree. And I, and I think that I like seeing her stand her ground and show who she truly is. You know, we're finding out who Ruby is through this journey as, as she is, but there's a piece of Ruby that we don't know about. And so we're getting to see it yeah. come alive. This um, episode, it being in a central location, really liked. I liked that even though the set, like they have the mouse money, right? The set was ugly. Like it was just like brown. It could have been a green screen. It could have been. There probably was some, mm-hmm. but I liked that it was simple because we really needed to focus on these characters because Shooty and Millie gave a performance. I know in our initial um, review that we had posted on social media, I had said something along the lines of this is like Shuti's doctor defining performance. Like this was just amazing. Him being able to convey the fear, the even when there's jokes being said, he still can convey like that, that tremble in his lip, the quick tears that are the falling tears. down. So good. And also being able to give like an impassioned speech while not really moving. <laughs> yeah. and and. You know, there's it's finding that balance of the doctor of needing to be in control of the situation, but also not knowing what the situation is. And I think that Shuti really brought that to life. He's he's calculating what's going on as he has one foot on this landmine. He's putting the pieces together and we're seeing him work through all that. And the beauty is, is that in Shuti's performance, it's not running across the room, grabbing this, grabbing that. It's being in one place and we're just watching his face, right. knowing that he's, he's doing the work. Yeah, he can't do the, the frantic doctor run right. um, like they, they just always like do. Run around the TARDIS and right. buttons and pull levers right. and stuff like that. He can't move. No. So we talked about the landmine quite a bit. So let's generally talk about this episode, right? So it's Valengard. Valengard is, it's been in Doctor Who history. Mm. It is exactly what they said. It's like... I don't know if the correct way to say it, but it's like a, a manufacturing planet that creates weapons. And like um, the doctor said in this episode, they're the biggest weapons manufacturer in recorded history. They have actually gone there before in past um, seasons. I think most recently it was 12 that went there. There was a, a Dalek named Rusty who was a good Dalek, um, but he doesn't want to be called a good Dalek. Um, so they're, they're kind of mysterious in that, but they manufacture weapons, mm-hmm. right? And I think the premise of this episode being so simple, but then adding, he didn't have to add all the commentary, right? He didn't have to add that, like, the AI algorithm is keeping you dying so you can keep buying, like making sure you're killing the right type of people and not helping them or giving them care. So that way they can then keep fighting is insane. Yeah. The, the war commentary, the war for profit commentary, I thought was really well done in this. And I'm glad that. Stephen Moffat was the person to handle that. Yeah, I think that it needs to be a person who is skilled in crafting a story because there really was so many layers to this, right? You could take it at the top layer and be like, it's about war. Oh, oh, it's about family. But then even when you see the Marines, 
they have the um, collars like a priest yeah. would have. And so we learn that they are ordained Anglican Marines. I'm glad you said it because I had a hard time saying, I was like, Pelican? No. <laughs> so Anglican means anything that has to do with the English church or, or related to the English church. And so that's like mind boggling, right? So, you know, we, we in our current society think about how much, well, we, we see how much, not think about, we see how much religion incites war. And so what happens when the actual ordained people are the soldiers, right? And so we hear talks um, between Mundy and um, her, com- her friend Canto about- her lover. Her lover, RIP, um, <laughs> of bishops. And that's like a higher rank right. and, and, and being ordained and having the divinity to make uh, these decisions. So everything is very much based in religion. Also, tattoo artist. Hey, hello. <laughs> just on the side, you got to have some fun. I'm glad the church allowed that. <laughs> well, or do they? Or is this right, something right. that they secretly have to hide? Right. Yeah. I, I think it's an interesting con- commentary. There has been instances where, like, the military organization has a religious undertone in it, in the doctor, um, the, in the universe, I should say. Um, there's been like clerics and stuff like that. So it is like a running thing that does happen. And I think it is really interesting because we see humanity at different points in history in the past or in the way future, future. And it's like, we get to see them at their worst and at their best. At what point is this, this sect of humans that went off to be these people that are just perpetuating their own war right? is insane. and having faith that this is the right thing to do that this war is truly what they're meant for even if they they just need to surrender and think about it yeah i want to there's so what the doctor says is faith is the magic word that keeps you never having to think for yourself wow yeah and i do like though at the end of this episode how he said or i think it's splice the little girl um or maybe it's monday but they said like she says something about having faith and then monday says like i thought you didn't like faith and he's like just because i didn't say I don't like it doesn't mean I don't need it. And I think generally faith, depending on, you know, where you're putting it and everything. And if it's for good, if it's for good reasons, typically it's good to have faith that something will work out. Right. It's supposed to. And I think that there are different levels of faith, right? So the word faith can mean your religion, that's your faith, or it can mean faith in yourself or faith in humanity. And so, right. You know, those different levels and what it means and what those types of faith have us do right. in our lives. And, and so that was just kind of like kind of mind blowing, right? Because when you hear him kind of say this line, you're like, dang, that's real. And then at the end, when he agrees with it, it kind of evens it out. Right. And, and that's an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. So I also just want to talk about, there's like very much the, the faith and the theory of this episode, but there's also the physicality of this episode. And I want to talk about the wild technology a little bit. I mean, we start off with like these like cheek phone things, which is like so wild. Yeah. It's almost like they answer and stuff like this. But when um, Splice's father asked about her doing her teeth, brushing her teeth, she like blew into her finger. And I'm like, wait, is the microphone also on the finger? Like what? The technology is funny. Like you you will see this um, as a new Whovian, I should say. Um, you're going to see technology like that where like you won't see it again and it will just come up in like a different form. But I, I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. And I like that you're kind of just like this thing is thrown into your face and you're like, wait, what's going on? Right. And it doesn't really have a lot to do with the plot. It's just an interesting detail about this group of people. It just it makes the world. It's those little tiny details that make the world feel alive. Right. And right. It makes it like, OK, they advance technology in this way to have face phones. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. <laughs> would you get a face phone? No. I mean, if that's what it was, yeah, I, I would have to. I'm not going to like walk around with my iPhone 10 just being like, I'm, I'm still here, guys. <laughs> I mean, it's literally taking that thing of people being like, you're walking around with a tracking device. It's like now it's just implanted in your face. <laughs> you are a tracking device. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Whatever. It make you explode at any time. It's fine. Do it. <laughs> um, another technology that we have to talk about is the ambulances. Mm-hmm. So Susan's twist sighting very up parent susan twist sighting so if you haven't seen her yet in these i would say three past episodes including episode zero this is her she's just different this time and she is the face of the the ambulance ai right 
Um, it's terrifying. Terrifying that when they sense combat, their sole purpose isn't to administer care. It is to see if you're viable enough to keep living. Yes. So Splice's father at the beginning of the episode, we see that there's something wrong with his eyes. And when he's with his colleague and they're walking through this wasteland, they see an ambulance in the distance and you would think, oh, good, they're going to get help. But they're like, hopefully it doesn't come to us. Yeah. And eventually it does. And just because he's not really fully blind, his eyes just need time to heal. It's temporary. But the four weeks is just too long to have to take care of him. So instead, they smelt him down into a human urn body (laughs) canister thing. Can we, since we're talking about like the physical technology stuff of this episode, can we talk about those urns? Yes. So it's a compressed body that looks like, you know, the bank tellers things that they put in the tubes and they go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But with the added benefit of a hologram. I... When Ruby was walking around trying to find something heavy enough to counter the balance of the doctor's weight, she picks up this weird thing, as she calls it. There's literally a human eyeball on it. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know what this is. I'm like, Rubes. Like, (laughs) okay, but let's stop for a second. (laughs) Let's Let's stop for a second and think. No, she should have stopped for a second. No, no, no. Okay, so (laughs) I'm sort of on board with the smelting cylinders. Because, right? Okay, so what's weirder, right? Putting bodies into a very compact cylinder, Mm -hmm. right? Or taking a body, taking all of its organs out, filling it with all sorts of fluid, sewing its eyes shut. Well, do you know what I mean? Like, that's weird. Mama. I think they're both weird. I think if they package the body a little better instead of like just seeing the fleshy, bony. Yeah, you know, I'm with you. Then I'd be okay with uh-huh. it, you know, because they have a really nice like plaque on it with the name. And That's it has great. your little AI message embedded in the top. You could talk to your friend whenever it's, you want. It's amazing. But like, just cover up the flesh part. Like, yeah. I don't, what am I going to do? Put that on the mantle? Well. Flesh. Maybe. <laughs> Wear it as a pendant. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's too Beautiful. big. Like, carry you wherever I no. go. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, an- an- another instance of great technology could be better. Yes. Like the face phones. I just, I, and like a little girl has it. So they do it very young. You're born with it. That must, maybe, it, maybe you're born with it. Maybe it's face phone. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's too much. And then let's talk a little bit about this landmine. Okay. Yes. So the landmine need, when something steps on it, it needs to know if you're actually a viable thing to kill. Yeah. If you're a rock, it'll let you go. <laughs> and so luckily for the doctor, I mean, I would have been done, dead, a million, like boom, farted, done. Uh-huh. Yeah. Farted for sure. Uh, <laughs> Whereas the doctor luckily has the wherewithal to stop. Right. And so when he's first on it, there's four fingers between the gauge. Right. To not make him blow up. Yeah. How horrifying. I, yeah. I mean, it, this is really interesting, too, because this concept has been done in Doctor Who. It's in Classic Who, mm. where like the doctor literally steps on a landmine and he's like, Charles, I just stepped on a landmine <laughs> and he can't move. Um, never really seen it. I've seen clips of it. And it's like, OK, whatever. Um, this is just elevated to more modern. Right. Mm. Um. It's terrifying. I think like even it measuring his adrenaline, right? But then the the mine itself, it it's not an explosive. Right. It turns your body down to its like molecular structure into pure energy, and that's what explodes. So that's where the extra stakes in this episode are of the doctor being a time event, being pure energy, a higher dimensional being. He has a lot of energy. Yeah. He's going to kill everybody on this planet. Right. Yikes. So it's not just him no. that would die. It would be everyone around him. So you thought Stephen Moffat was like, okay, he's on, he's on a landmine and like there's people and stuff like that. Boo. Let me just up the stakes a little bit. The ambulance is going to try to kill you. The doctor is going to kill everybody. It's just this episode did a really good job of the pacing of the tension because he's on that landmine within like two minutes of the episode and it's like oh that sucks and then the daughter comes because she hears her dad she's trying to get to her dad and then they're like no don't come here and then mundi comes and then kondo comes and then the ambulance comes and i'm like i can't i need everybody to stop yes and there's just like misunderstanding after misunderstanding right so ruby is trying to get the ambulance to focus on her kanto sees her he shoots her i specific the Having the doctor, every time something would happen, my eye would always go to the doctor. 
because this is like the worst thing for the doctor to be in, not being able to help, not being able to do anything. He's seeing all of this happen. He can't comfort this little girl when he realizes like, I have her dead dad in my hand. How am I supposed to tell her? Monday comes, I can't give her this thing because I'll die and everybody else will die. And then seeing his companion get shot, what is he supposed to do? I don't know. I mean, he must have been very zen to see Ruby get shot and learn that she has like five minutes to live. That would have made my blood pressure go through the roof. Boom, boom, boom. My God. Dead. Great, though. Great television. So the ambulance does this thing where it needs to give you a sharp scratch, I think it's called. And, And so it's kind of reading your vitals. And so when Ruby falls on the floor, it sends one into her and we get this bizarre thing where it's giving us all of her stats. And the one stat is that she's 3,082 years old. Yeah. What's your question? (laughs) I mean, we knew something was special about Ruby. It's real interesting. It's really interesting. I yeah. She would almost have to be, you know, we saw in one of the earlier episodes, the doctor doing readings on her. Like she already goes out of the TARDIS and you see on the screen, he kind of looks at it and it's scanning her, trying to figure out like what's up with her. Mm. So he always, he already has it in the back of his mind. So for this ambulance to confirm something of like, she's not like a normal human age thing. Right. And is the, my, my thing is, is she really that old or is because they're in the future? Is it saying she's 3,082 years old because that's how far in the future they are from when she was born? That was one of the things I was thinking as well. So that could be a thing. Or here's another theory. It's a red herring. (laughs) Or what if Ruby isn't a person at all, (laughs) but Ruby is a song. And that song is 3,082 years old. (laughs) I'm serious. Oh, I thought you I thought you made up a song 3,082 years No, no, years no, old. no. I'm saying that she is as old as that. You know, when she is dropped off at that church, we don't know when that is taking place. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think when the maestro had her up with all the music notes and stuff, he said there's a hidden song. And the, hidden, the song that came out was Carol of the Bells. Mm-hmm. And I'm not too sure what that meaning means. Um yeah, there's, there's a, there is a lot of music. When she was about to hand him that urn to calm her down or get her ready for it, it's not one, two, three. She stopped him from counting. She said, I need something rhythmic. Mm-hmm. I need a beat. And so he sings. More singing, more songs. It's, it's interesting. I, there's too many musical um, analogies, too many musical meanings that could mean anything. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see how he ties that all together yeah because if she is let's say part of this pantheon right she could be is the doctor also part of that who knows but if she's part of that what is her thing right it's like the toy maker is imagination it's games and everything maestro is music what then would ruby be so she's a gem she's a song She's just, she's a song of all the songs. <laughs> she's 3,082 years old. Yeah. But I, I had that thought about the, the time travel as well. It's like, mm-hmm. does your age change just because you're traveling through time? Well, I, I would think that a machine that's reading like your carbon dating, it's mm-hmm. like, oh, would it read it as however old you are? If the scientists were to use uranium <laughs> and carbon date you, that's yeah. how old it would say you are. Uh, we also get another scene of snow in yes. this and so what's interesting is that Mundy and Kanto are like it doesn't snow here like this isn't any like this isn't real and then the doctor just says no it's ruby yeah like this is just ruby he knows i think at this point he doesn't know what it means but he knows it happens um it was startling to see it stop mm. you know because the doctor is literally a min sentence as long as it's fall and then it stops that's not good so it's interesting whenever she's literally about to die, the snow is falling, but then it just stops. So I'm curious. I mean, I don't want her to die, but like, I'm curious what would happen. Like, why is the snow there? It doesn't seem like the snow is helping her in any yeah. way. It's just more of like an effect. It's not really boding well for Ruby that an episode from episodes zero through three, she has almost died 
probably three times. The doctor said your lifespan isn't great. <laughs> it's not looking That's good. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, she might die at the end of this. She could. She, she, yeah, who knows? Can we, before we get into other stuff, we've mentioned her name a few times, Monday. Mm. Um, when I first initially watched this, I thought they were saying Monday. Um, which then the joke of the doctor saying you should marry Ruby because then you would be Monday, Sunday. Um, fantastic joke. I love it. It's so stupid, but it's so great. But it's Monday, right? Um, what's even more interesting is the actor that plays her mm -hmm. has been in um, Andor. Fantastic series. You should watch it. Um, but the BBC a couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, had announced that she is going to be a companion. This actor is going to be the doctor's companion. So, I mean, I don't see her being the companion as Monday. So that just brings up a lot of questions of like, is whoever going to be the doctor's companion regenerate into looking like her? Like, what does this mean? This is bizarre. The only thing I can think of is that at the end of this episode, the doctor says, and I'm going to stop by again, you know, and my favorite food is, was it fish sticks and custard? Fish, fish sticks and custard. Fish sticks and custard. Which is a callback to right. Matt Smith's 11th hour yes. introduction episode. Um, disgusting meal, but it's, it's a fave. Like full on scoops of custard. Of course, <laughs> of course, Moffat would be like. Yeah, the first show running episode I did, I'm going to call back to it. Of course. Absolutely. But so he says, I'm going to come back. I'm going to visit. So is, it could just be Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And he could just be like, I'm going through the week. I had Ruby Sunday and now I have Monday. That's, Stop. And then Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> now we just have to watch out. I just find it really interesting, right? Like, yeah, I guess that could happen, right? I, I, I missed the line where he said, I'm going to come back. Um, it's, it's just interesting. Typically, at least from what I'm thinking, you know, Peter Capaldi was in an episode of Doctor Who way before he became the Doctor, right? Mm. Typically, there's like time in between when they like come back. Um, so it's to me, I find it weird that like she's introduced this early and then is going to be a companion. It could happen, but like that's bizarre. Maybe with how much he changed her life and her views on faith and everything, maybe then when he does come back, she she wants more. Right? She might say. You're right about everything. Everything I've ever known has been a lie. Or proved to me. Right. <laughs> right. Because what he basically uncovers is that they are fighting no one. Right. They are just a profit machine for villain guard. And so that's mind altering. That's life changing. And so I think it could make sense that he goes back and she says, I want to join you on this journey. I want to see more of what the universe has to offer. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. Like, I, I'm excited. I like Barada Sathu. So her being a companion, I'm, it's going to be interesting if they overlap or is it going to be both of them? Because there has been like four companions mm -hmm. at once. So it's going to be fun to see the dynamic add another companion to that, however long that's going to last. I believe she does come in in season two. Spoiler, it, it was already announced everywhere. Um, so I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'm just hoping that it's one of those things where Ruby is like, you know what, Mundy, it's your time it's time for me to go home and be with my mom and raise those babies. You go on this journey now. That's what I'm hoping for because my heart is already broken thinking about Ruby not surviving this. You know which doctor had all their companions safe and sound? None of them. Jodie Whittaker. Oh, okay. They even have a support group that they made. Well, that I love. With like people that have traveled with the doctor. They are the only doctor... <laughs> Since it's new who that have like got off fine. Everybody else, specifically Matt Smith, not great. So what you're saying is don't get your hopes up. No, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't get my hopes up. I know you're new to Doctor Who, um, but just be prepared. But like, isn't that the worst when they make you fall in love with someone and then they break your heart? That's why we watch this. No. <laughs> yeah. It's like the Nicole Kidman AMC thing. Yeah. That's why we come here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cinema. <laughs> no. It's so terrible. So let's wrap up this episode, right? Because I do think that the end of it itself um, is really interesting. High stakes. It's like on a, a, a knife's edge this entire episode. And to add more heartbreak to it in typical 
Moffat fashion. Why not? Yeah, why not? Um, Kanto and Mundi have this like, you know, kind of romantic tension. She even says to his face, yeah, because of this romantic tension we have, like playing around. It's not play. They both love each other. Him dying and then saying, like saying those words over and over. And she's like, I can't see you. Where are you? And then she sees him and his hologram. I was like, that is not okay. No. I, first time I watched it, tear. Tear in my eye. I don't know these people. <laughs> <laughs> I've just met them. I've just met them. Why? I care about well, them. <laughs> Must be the writing. Yeah. I just like, it's that thing of like, you know what made me cry is when he said, you were designated as my favorite person. And it's like, I don't know his family life, but it's like the fact that he didn't send it to his family and he sent, if he doesn't have one, um, but sent it to her. Ugh, so sad. Yeah. It's so good though. Like these are the things of like, sometimes the most beautiful stories in Doctor Who is when it's the saddest mm. because it makes you appreciate those things that you have, mm. right? And it's like, that's really sad that that was his favorite person, but it's like, I'm glad I have my favorite person, but it's like, I would also be sad if that happened. You know, it's just, yeah. Oh, I mean, so if, you, good. if you think about it, right, he, when we see him back at base, he's trying so much to get Mundy to come back because he knows it's not safe for her out there. So he does risk his life to go and find her and save yeah. her and ultimately does give that sacrifice. Uh, so sad. So sad, especially the fact that the freaking ambulance kills him as he, they're realizing that they both love each other. Yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah. That's the, fucked up. The fact, too, of like just this whole conversation of AI and uh, Valengard and all of that and its whole purpose is to perpetuate this war that means nothing um, is insane. And the way that the doctor gets Monday to realize it, which there's a point when he says something like, do you get it? And she looks at Splice and I think she's always kind of known but because of her faith and because of what she's around and everything, she didn't really want to believe it. It almost seemed like she didn't want to say it in front of her. And she's like, do I say it? like, she's right here. This little girl that lost her. Am I supposed to say her father died in vain for nothing in front of her? Yeah, you're going to have to. And the doctor pushing it. Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? Oh, master, master for work. Yeah. So good. I just want to bring out one other moment that I felt was really heartbreaking when Ruby is dying and the ambulance asks her, who's your next of kin? And she just keeps going, who's my next of kin? Who's my well, next of so kin? I, is that what the ambulance asked? Yeah. Oh, what I, how I heard that was it was searching for next of kin. Was it asking her or was it searching for? I mean, I guess either well, way. Either way. She, she doesn't, doesn't know. know. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was just saying because I took it a different way. And well, it was like trying to search for it. And she's like, I'm dying. Who is it? Can you tell me who it is? Mm. Well, um, either way, wow, that's even heartbreaking too. It's so sad. Yeah. She's dying. And she's like, who is it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know Man. where my life is going Man. from here. Yeah. Oh. But I, okay, so we also have this little girl whose father has just died. Yeah. And yet she's like, no, it's okay. I will see him again. Yeah. Because of her faith. Yeah. So it's just another layer. Yeah. To that. And, you know, I mean, Obviously, I don't want to talk about religion. I have my own views on religion and other people do as well. Um, but I like that they did that right mm -hmm. at the end of this episode because the doctor was combating it quite a bit in this episode, which I think is important to question things like don't just blindly follow things like question it. Um, and in the end, when she says, yeah, you know, my mother was gathered up and my dad's not gone. I'll, I'll see him again at some point. And then when he's with Ruby, she's like, that, that's sad, though. Like he's dead. He's gone. He's like, what? Yeah, yeah, but we're all kind of like dying, you know? Yeah, so it's he's like, like, we're all just snowflakes that are going to melt. Yeah, but it's everything's a beach eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but if it makes her happy, it's not hurting anybody for right. her to think that, right? I Ugh. think ultimately the message here that he says at the end is what survives of us is love. Mm -hmm. And it's very much the thought of, it's yes, we may be here in, for only a blink of an eye, but make sure what you leave behind is love. It, it harkens back to the other thing that we're covering when Kurt tells Gambit, love is best measured and what we forgive. Uh, I love love quotes that aren't just like love is love. 
You know what I mean? Like, I mean, love is love. Girl. <laughs> Girl. <laughs> Not on the, this podcast. <laughs> that was the first one that popped in my head. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Where it like. He doesn't want live, love, love. <laughs> no. Live, love, love. Um, the ones that like give that extra layer of love, right? Like the, the things that do make up love. Um, great. I'm very excited for this season. I haven't been this excited for Doctor Who in a long time. And it's very exciting. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, the the incredible thing is, is that this episode really just was one situation for an hour. And we've managed to talk about it so much. There's there so, was so much. much there. Yeah, yeah. There was so much there. All of those ambulances coming. Thank, thank you for AI Daddy for just like wiping out all of the Velen Guard. He became a hacker. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Dust to dust. Dad to dad. Oh. So good. 73 Yards is next. I have no idea what that one's about. I don't either. It looks like a town that's going crazy. It looks like it's Dr. Light. Sometimes um, in Doctor Who seasons, because the Doctor is like usually the main star, right? Sometimes for a little break, there's episodes where the Doctor isn't in it as much. Mm. So it does seem like that's going to be a Dr. Light episode, which I'm happy with. Yeah, sure. I like those episodes. You know, I need a little more Ruby. I'll be honest. Yeah. It was she she keeps falling asleep at the end of these episodes. She's <laughs> yeah. always just strung up somewhere yeah. with snow falling snow. around her. Yeah. All right. So send your thoughts to ABO Nibbles at Gmail. Let us know. Yeah. Live left love. See you Monday. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>